All right, let's take it away. So I'm Professor Richard Ray. I'm Payvon Dude. Uh, pleasure to uh, see all of you today. I'm so glad you came out to this meeting. I just want to say a couple introductory things uh, briefly about the series of events that we're starting uh, today. So uh, we are both members of the Academic Placement Committee here at UVA, something that I want every UVA student to at least know about. And we're going to start to have events about every three to four weeks during the school year that are going to give you a variety of different bits of information or perspective about the legal academy, why to do it, what are paths to do it, how to to do it successfully. Uh, part of the lesson of these events is going to be applicable to your regular legal careers, uh, paper writing, agenda writing, and stuff like that. And I encourage anyone who is even possibly interested in being a law professor, which I think includes everyone because the title of this event is Should I Consider Being a Law Professor? By being here, you have demonstrated that you're already considering it. It's kind of like a moot issue at this point. Just send uh, one of us an email and we'll get you on this mailing list so you can get updates. Because later down the road, you might decide I might want to learn more about being a law professor, I might have wanted to know something and the email list will help you get that information. Uh, and one last brief thing, uh, which is that we are recording this event, as you can all tell, uh, to be posted uh, online so that alums can take advantage of this and other events that we're going to be uh, holding. Do you want to say a little introductory remark? Yeah, I'll say that I too, when I was a law student, would come to these Should I Be a Law Professor events. And it wasn't until maybe like five years after graduating that I proceeded down the path of actually becoming a law professor. And it was really helpful to be aware of the terminology and some of the steps that I might choose to take along this path, even though it was well after graduation that I started taking the concrete sorts of steps that we'll learn about through the series. Great. Um, I might start us off by just saying some of the things that I really like about being a law professor and why I chose this career path. Uh, and then you can jump in whenever and we can just maybe find out if we like the same things or different things. So the four big things that I love about being a law professor. Uh, number one, I like being able to set my own intellectual agenda. So I like being able to say one day, you know what, I'm really interested in this area of law. I'm going to go study that and research that myself. Uh, whereas by contrast, when I was in practice, which I actually did for a few years, it would be other people telling me to a great extent, not totally, but to a great extent what I needed to spend my, um, my time on. I really like the flexibility and autonomy of being a law professor. This is probably something you've discerned by watching your own professors in action. It's a very uh, time unstructured line of work. It doesn't mean there's not things to do, but it means that the order in which you do them is substantially up to you. Again, if you have clients, for example, that may not be the case. Clients may tell you, as happened to me, for example, one time at 11 p.m., how I'd be spending the next 12 hours of my uh, uh, conscious life. Uh, I really like being able to answer questions when I state an opinion the way I think is correct. Uh, whereas again, by contrast, when you have a client, it may be a great thing, but very often the range of expressible views is sharply curtailed by who you're representing or who you might represent in the future. And lastly, I like that related to that, when I write something, I can at least tell myself that I'm trying to write something that is deep and lasting and that has a somewhat broader range of audience interest. Whereas again, by contrast, when I was in practice, which was you know, great as well, but very often I was writing things that were of interest to the parties in the litigation and the case, and it would be forgotten as soon as the case was decided. So those are kind of of some pros on my end. I personally have an agenda that's like informed by the time that I spent in practice and there were all these questions that I had when I was in the Solicitor General's office or when I was practicing where I really wanted to know the answer and there was no time to sort of figure it out and learn. And so my favorite thing about my job is that I actually get to learn what I want to learn and I'm continuously learning about different areas of the law for my colleagues. And so I think if you don't use it, you lose it. And I get to use it in this job. Yeah. Are there any things you don't like about being a law professor? I mean, everybody's going to complain about grading, but it wasn't <laughs> as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, and sometimes, I mean, when you put an idea to rest, I found it really hard to figure out when I'm done with something or when it's done with me. And so that's something I'm still figuring out and struggling. Yeah, for sure. It's like you're so invested in what you're doing, it's hard to hard to know where to draw the line. Yeah, I'll say, so we, we both also had, had some uh, practice experience. I'll say, when I look back at my practice years, a uh, few as though they were, what are the things I kind of miss? And that maybe sometimes in my current job, I'm like, wow, I wish I could have a little bit more of that. Kind of a flip side for me. So it's almost like mirror images of the things I just said. When you're in practice, there's usually at least one person who really, 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 really cares about what you're doing. Uh, maybe more than one person, uh, especially if you have like a pro bono client. I mean, it could be the fate of someone's career or freedom at, at stake in the case you're working on. Whereas by contrast, there's a lot of time being a law professor. I'll, I'll just say it, you're writing, you don't know if anyone's gonna read it. 
it's kind of like writing into the void and there's a hope they'll have an influence but you don't know and I think some people maybe even me sometimes I'm like you know maybe I'd rather be doing something that has a very focal focus immediate uh, appeal to people uh, I would say that the legal academy has a degree of market rigidity that is related to the tenure dynamic that creates flexibility. But the market rigidity means that you may not be able to move when you want to or where you want to when you're looking for a job. And that can be quite frustrating for many people, especially if they're geographically constrained. Uh, a third thing I'll say that I didn't really realize until I got a few years into the legal academy. And uh, maybe you'll disagree with me about this. I don't Maybe others, Professor Cope, I see Kim Cope is in the back. Maybe he'll disagree with me on this. But I think that as compared with a lot of other types of work, there's a fundamentally static structure to being a law professor, at least for many law professors, because you're teaching and you're researching and you're writing. And that could be happening in the 40th year of the job or the first year of the job. Whereas at least many other careers, you, know, you could become a dean of a law school, you could do other things, you could go in the government. But in many other careers, by the time you're doing in your 40th year, you're just doing something very different. You could be a manager, you could be running a firm, you could be consulting the president or something like that. And I think as I'm going through this, I'm realizing, wow, you know, some of my peers who are doing other career paths, their jobs seem more transformative over time. Maybe that's something good. Uh, and the last thing I'll say that I think also maybe is, is disputable, but I think as compared to the alternative median job, being a law professor is pretty cerebral. A lot of the work is in your head. If you're like an appellate lawyer, maybe that's also true in practice, but a lot of lawyers I think are talking to people, talking to clients, hustling for business, arguing in court, talking to witnesses. I, I don't feel like I do a ton of that. What do you think? I will respond and say, I feel like student interaction is something I really enjoy a lot. And that's not like the same thing as direct services of being a lawyer, right? But like I have cerebral time and then I also have student time and not to say it's not cerebral, but it's not me sitting in a, a room thinking to myself. And I think that there are a lot of openings to being able to consult the president or do other sorts of things. But maybe I just don't feel like it's a static kind of job because I've only been doing it for two years, right? So I might feel that way in a few years if I haven't sort of figured out another way to channel like an itch if I had it. Yeah. Really? You want to say anything else, Brian? I see, yeah. I was going to ask Professor Cope <laughs> to come up and yeah, say. I'm still on the fence about being a law professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's totally right. I, I, for one, I co author most of my pieces. Mm. I think you too, most of it. So I get a little bit more of that engagement through co-authoring versus a little bit more common in writing areas adjacent to social science and, and so forth. But I also do miss the kind of having a dynamic law office coming in and so forth. And, uh, that's why you see me sitting in stone dining room of Scott College to feel like I'm still around people. Mm. Indeed, right now, maybe that helps explain why you're here right now. <laughs> I also feel like this is something that I should mention because I heard it at my first, should I become a law professor? One of my law professors was in the room and he said, I should just say that law professors get paid mostly in utils. <laughs> and someone was like, at the end of class, raised, at the end of the thing, raised his hand and was like, can you talk about those oodles that law professors are being paid? And he was like, not oodles, udles. So that's just something to, to note and know. I've never felt the need to sort of figure that out in a, you know, like weird ways, but it's something I heard at the very first meeting and I think a lot of people sort of flocked away after that. <laughs> I like udles. I, I, I love that comment, I love the whole thing. What's a utility? <laughs> <laughs> like utility, oh, enjoyment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you ideally you want to align what gives you satisfaction with whatever you're doing. But I, I think the comment is insightful because there are a lot of people in practice. I know some of these people. I've worked with some of these people. I, I've been some of these people sometimes where they're literally saying, "I am not enjoying what I'm doing, but I'm making cash." Right, and I think you know, not everyone in practice is like that. Thank goodness, by any means. But but you you don't see many law professors saying that. I'll just say, <laughs> either half of that equation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, you should like what it is that you're doing. And I do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, we've been talking for a while. Does anyone have any questions for us? Yeah. Um, so one of the 
when you're a law professor, do you, do some law professors maintain like a bar uh, bar membership and maybe still help some clients on the side or pro bono work or that kind of thing? Are you exclusively dedicated to this academia? So the question is, when you are a law professor, do you maintain an active, do some professors maintain an active bar membership and participation in litigation and things like that? You want to take it away? I'll say that there are different ways to be a law professor that we'll explore throughout uh, the year, right? Clinical professors obviously have an active sort of roster that's part of their job. Um, I have... I have an active bar membership. I'm not active in using it right now, but I did take my talents, I guess. I testified before Congress last semester. I do other sorts of things. And I know lots of folks who write pro bono briefs or amicus briefs on issues that they really care about. And at least one member of our faculty who is actively involved in major litigation against, is it the state of Louisiana? Is it a county within Louisiana? Franklin, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. A lot. <laughs> yeah. So I think you can have it be a part of your career and a part of your teaching and your writing. But if you are sort of a doctrinal professor, the expectation is that you are producing research and writing and you can do other things as an adjunct to it, but not sort of instead of it. Yeah, I think, I think the, especially the, the last thing there was exactly on, on, on point. For me, I feel like, especially as I'm getting a little bit further along the line here, I wanna do a little bit more practice-ish stuff, whether it's consulting. A few years ago, I wrote an amicus brief um, for the Supreme Court, representing myself, just as a, you know, a scholar talking about something I was researching, because they're hearing a case on exactly what I was researching on, and that was a really rewarding, cool thing that kind of revisit practice and being a brief writer after taking several years away. Uh, it was. I'll just say a brief anecdote about that. It, it was a very, very interesting experience and rewarding for, in many ways. But one thing that was weird about it was, I was like, okay, I got to write a brief. I haven't done this in a while. First thing I should do, I should master the record. So I start reading the record. And I was reading like the opinion below. I was like, why is the opinion below saying all this stuff that this is obviously wrong and this is obviously wrong and this is a, oh, the court below is trying to follow precedent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like kind of like snapped me back in the gear about that. And then file and then crafting a brief that was, you know, at least a little bit practice aware while trying to make an independent freestanding scholarly contribution. So for that, that's my main example of doing that. But I would personally would like to do more. Um, I like to do more that's in the pro bono space or, or consulting or or testifying or other things like that. Different people strike that balance differently. But again, I think I think the point is exactly right that that I think for most scholars and for most institutions, it should be in tandem with doing deep independent research, not in the alternative. Okay, yeah. So during both your times in the practice beforehand, like did you come across specific research areas that you knew you wanted to explore as an academic and to what extent do you think it's important to have identified specific areas you want to pursue before kind of entering the, the process generally? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I, I take the question to be what is the relationship between work and experience in practice and then subsequent work in the academy? Uh, you know, obviously, some people go to the legal academy without doing any legal practice. Both of us, I think, have done significant legal practice before being academics. Uh, and I, I agree uh, very much that for me, practice was critical for having an initial agenda. It gave me awareness of things and problems to, to be interested in and a little bit of expertise. Uh, so I think it can definitely be especially, especially valuable at the beginning. So I've noticed sometimes people, uh, sometimes people's research agendas almost get, um, are almost most interesting at the beginning or when they've just come out of government or something because they've seen all these things that people reading public source materials can't easily see. So, uh, so that's definitely the case for me. So like, well, just to give one silly example maybe, but it's really the amicus brief I was talking about. The brief was on something called the Marx rule, don't worry about it if you don't know what that is. But I had encountered as a clerk and in practice Marx rule questions. And it just really struck me as a bizarre, horrible feature of our legal system. And so that kind of propelled me to write about it later and try to contribute to that debate. I also heard a sort of broader question in what you asked, which mm -hmm. is to what extent should I sort of know what I want to do and study when I become a law professor? And I actually think that that's something you should spend time figuring out, right? Like I think the most valuable thing that you can do while you're in law school, some people will say is start writing. I would hmm. say figure out like, is this something you want to do all the time? Is there some part of the law that you've picked up on where you're like, that's really interesting. I want to do this and I want to dedicate my 
life or a substantial portion of my life to figuring this out and teaching other th other people about it. And so I figured out in law school, like, man, I love Fed courts. <laughs> and I think <laughs> Professor Ray figured out the exact same thing. I right? Not in law school, but we talking about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, how do I do Fed courts all the time? This is a problem none of you will have. Right? <laughs> but like I can only do Fed courts all the time if I'm an academic. Right? Otherwise I can do it 30% of the time. And that just wasn't enough for me. Yeah, just, just to respond to that question you asked me, it's interesting for me to remember that. When I was in law school, I was not interested in the Fed courts. I took the class, it was fine. Uh, it didn't really click for me as being something on, that I should understand or appreciate in a big way. It was, it was actually the practice experience where I was like, wow, actually these somewhat arcane technical procedural issues, first off, I'm capable of understanding them, which wasn't obvious to me in law school. And second, once I've understood them, I realized, wow, a lot actually turns on this. And maybe the amount that people are thinking about them is not in proportion to their significance. And so that by then I had a little bit of the knowledge, I had gotten a little bit of confidence, a little bit of interest, and a little bit of sense that maybe I can contribute to this in a way that I didn't realize. So it, it's actually you know, very responsive to your question, that my own path that I hadn't even appreciated when you first asked it, that my, my practice experience kind of led me to this when law school had not. Yeah. Yeah, so what does your typical week look like? Like, for instance, how many hours do you spend on writing, teaching, like preparing for class? Great question. What if you did? So, what does your typical week look like? I think my typical week depends on whether we're in the semester and I'm teaching, or if it's a time over the summer where I'm focusing mostly on research and writing. Um, typical week, there is a significant amount of class prep, at least for me. I'm only in my second year of teaching, and I'm in class. I'm figuring out what to teach in class, how to teach it better, things like that. Probably for at least half or maybe more of the week. I also have like peppered in certain deadlines on my writing within the semester because I think that I love it like a firm date to get something out. So I have to get something out today. So I was working all weekend and also much later today uh, on my research. But after I get this thing out, I probably won't focus on my research again for another couple of weeks. Yeah. Um... I'm trying to think how to, how to uh, if I even have a pattern, but I'm trying to give it like a representative week. So um, I guess I would do, for every hour of class, uh, I would do probably two hours of focus prep on that class session, having already kind of pre-gamed it coming into the semester to some extent. Um, and I spent a lot of time reading stuff that looks interesting from the Twitter or, or people sending me stuff or asking me to referee stuff or recommend, you know, comment on stuff. A lot of, so that's like a large fraction is just like kind of browsing the, the area. Uh, and then I think what, on a good week, I'm spending a lot of time trying to write stuff. I'm spending, I'm spending out mo several hours a day outlining stuff, jotting stuff down, writing stuff in the margins, maybe working on a draft, with an Im especially if there's an imminent deadline to get something out. Uh, and so and so then, so those are kind of like the, the floatable times. Uh, and then there's there's class and office hours and events like this. So I think, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's like an hour by hour breakdown, but but that that's kind of how I feel about it. It's like there are these, there are these like things out there that I can kind of allow myself to get sucked into when the time permits, and it, it, it permits a lot. I'm not sure that was a coherent answer. Yes? I have a follow-up question on the question about research topics. Yeah. Um, it's kind of two parts. The first is, uh, are there any other mechanisms that you use other than what you talked to already about your practical experiences to identify holes in the legal research that you would be interested in writing something about that hasn't already been written about by lots of people? Um, and the second aspect is, I think it's it's easy to identify what's interesting to you, but do you, how do you figure out what's also going to be interesting to others, so that if you write about it, other people will actually want to read read what you wrote. Why well, don't they want to try to repeat that? Uh, two questions. <laughs> yeah. The first question is, other than practice experience, where else are you getting sort of the interesting ideas and figuring out spaces that other people haven't sort of exhausted in the literature? And number two, 
how do you find ideas that are also interesting to other people and that they'll want to read your papers when you write them? What's the answer to that? <laughs> I haven't figured it out. <laughs> so I would, I would say that for the first one, one piece of advice that I got is when you are writing like a student note, people tell you write about something that no one has written about before and like fill this discrete category mm. where you're making a contribution. Legal scholarship is different. Right, you want to be part of a discussion. And so it doesn't mean that you should run away from a topic that other people have spent their time also in. You just have to have a unique point of view, perspective, and contribution to make to an already existing discussion. Right, like if you're saying no one has ever theorized about any of this stuff ever before, you're going to have a really hard time finding people to read your work on the back end, I think. Yeah. I mean, if I see, so it's this, I'm not sure there's one answer to the, these kinds of questions. Like a lot of these questions are kind of like what's, you know, your mileage may vary. I, I think, I think one interesting thing is the difference between like a, like a paper for law school and a note and an entry level market paper and like a post tenure paper. There's lots of different, those are themselves different genres and there's different genres within, within that space, within each space. So I think it's somewhat consistent uh, with what Prof. Duce just said. I guess I would say that the, the most generalizable answer I can think of is, if you're reading a lot in the genre that you want to contribute in, that's the way to find out. That's, now, now th that's the way to find out how to shape your intervention, whether your intervention is the right kind of inter intervention for that genre. But it kind of goes back to the practice question and some of the other things we were talking about. You don't want to just be recycling the stuff that people have already said, which believe me, everyone, this happens so much. I mean, so many fields are just recycling the same ideas over and over. Ideally, you want to say, I saw something in the world, or I counted something in the world, or I, um, I heard something in the world, I've seen something in the world that is new and that I can bring to this existing conversation. Prokop, do, I see, do you, have, you want to give an answer to this too? Maybe you have a, a different take? On, on where to find. Good ideas, I guess. It's a bit different because I did a PhD, so I spent five years just sort of reading stuff and in conversation. I, part of my research agenda and my job talk paper kind of sprung off what my dissertation advisor was doing and we're trying to take it in a new direction. So I'm not sure that's such a good model, although I'll just say doing a PhD is a, probably a good model for <laughs> bolstering here. Your chances. Um, so, uh, but, but other than that, it's basically the same. You know, I'm reading what others have written in the area, just sitting around, you know, thinking deep thoughts. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you'll read things and people will point out, oh, we really need more research in this area. Right? And you can springboard off of that. And other times, um, you just, you know, just something just occurs to you. Um, and usually it's a combination of those two. It's really hard to answer in the abstract. Yeah. It's much easier to answer as to a particular set of questions um, because you know, different questions will probably have different answers whether, depending on the subject. For those watching on the internet, Professor Cope has underscored <laughs> getting a PhD as a good way into the academy and also has doubled down on Professor Ray's read lots of stuff. <laughs> yes, and we'll do more on paths to the academy uh, in, a, in a later event. I think you just gotten yourself an invitation to that panel, so. <laughs> okay. I think I know what he's gonna say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, when I, I went to Northwestern, so um, they had a manual for how to get into law teaching. And I'm not kidding, the person who wrote it said like the best way, best the one more thing you can do to get into law teaching is to get a, a JD from Yale Law School. <laughs> person was from Yale. So, yeah, we'll save that for the next panel, I guess. Yeah, but it's, it's, it, it's a good thing that advice is, uh, is, is not just uh, uh, inapt in the context, but, but seriously flawed on, on, its own, on its own terms. There are many paths. Let's say, I think you know, different people like their own path, or actually sometimes they don't like their own path. It's actually kind of interesting. People either, all, all advice I, in my personal experience is either I did X and it was awesome and so should you, or I did X and it was horrible and you should never should. So you know, all, all these different perspectives, you're, you gotta put them in a blender and figure out what works for yourself. Um, 
I'll just say briefly, getting somewhat ahead of the, the occasion here, because we're talking about how to become a law professor. I don't think there is one one path, as, as you know, Prof. Cope's anecdotes just indicated. I mean, there's, the, there's like a PhD path, there's a fellowship path, there's a straight from practice path. Each of us represents one of those paths, each of the three faculty members in this in this room. And they have pros and cons and different odds of success, but, but it's complicated. So whatever path you think might work for you, let's talk about it. <laughs> Come to the center. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I'm not sure if this question but I, I'm, if, if, if a, a professor or someone is giving a lecture, this would be a hard question on, on how should he handle this? Because I know as a legal advisor, for example, if, if, if a client is asking a question in a meeting on spot, it's okay to say, I'll have to do further research on this and get back to you. But if it's in a lecture or a class, and a hard question is on spot. I have to look into that, one second. What's the right answer to this question? <laughs> So the question is, <laughs> uh, how do law professors answer hard questions on the spot? Should they answer them or not? Sometimes I just answer them with my. I mean, if, 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 if you just doesn't have the answer in your head. I never don't have the answer in my head. No. <laughs> I, I mean, I think I think what you said about your own experiences sounds like is exactly right. If you don't know, you don't know, and you say that, and you maybe think through it in the moment. I think one of the great things that prepping for law teaching can do for anybody is help them be comfortable being honest and thinking creatively in the moment to work through an answer uh, in a way that lets people see you think. Uh, the worst thing, I'll just say, it's, it's not great in the classroom if you say the wrong thing, but if you're in practice, when things actually matter, as I, I think your, your anecdote and your expression suggests you already realize this, but I'll just say it. Someone says something and you're not sure the answer and you say, say the answer like you think you know and you're wrong, it can be very bad. It's even worse. <laughs> If you're arguing in front of a court, yeah. okay? <laughs> yes, yes. It's just uh, some advice from yes. a teacher, student. Yes. Don't do it. I have seen others do it. Don't be the liar. Yeah. Or just make a mistake, you know what I'm saying? Is that responsive? Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, does it, this does not give an impression that uh, the audience will just be confident in well, the, so the follow-up is, d does a teacher have to worry about losing the confidence of the students? And uh, there's a lot in there that we could maybe unpack in a session on teaching, but I would just say briefly that what would, I think, be more likely to lose anyone's confidence is hubristically saying something with confidence that's false. So it could be comfortable making mistakes. That's one of the great things. You know, a lot of professors are saying a lot of things out there. They can't all be right, but most of them have a lot of confidence and, and comfort. We can all learn something from that. As a large group of people that are starting out on our, our uh, what we hope to be legal careers down the road, what sparked your interest? I, I know you kind of alluded to this earlier of like you went to sessions, you you kind of explored topics that sparked your, your creative thinking in law school. What courses or what activities that you got involved in really kind of um, are very beneficial for where you sit now? Um, and what encouragement would you give to people that are kind of somewhat interested in this idea other than going to these sessions? Getting involved in yeah. these other things to explore this as well. Great. So the question is, uh, what things in law school helped us become on the path that we're on now in the academy? Um, and so, apart from sessions like this, so I'll just, I'll just preliminarily say, sessions like this are good. Being on the mailing list is good. If you're, if you're here, you should be on the mailing list and maybe come, become valuable for years later. You don't even realize. I just want to replug that. That's actually totally true. That's how I figured stuff out was I was on this mailing list that I ignored for five years. Yes. I, I, I'm still on some of these mailing lists, and they're still teaching me stuff sometimes. So it's worth it. Um, so, But to answer your question more directly about what, what you can do, I, I think, in my opinion, looking at my own experience, I, I was not looking to be a law professor even at the end of law school. Uh, I was frankly... Uh, I kind of, it's funny, I arrived at law school planning to be a kind of a law professor and then became disillusioned with it and fell in love, thank goodness, fell in love with a kind of practice. I fell in love with criminal procedure practice, completely unplanned, unintentionally, I'll, I'll tell the fuller story later. And so the thing that eventually got me back to the academy was the fact that I had found something that I love thinking about and researching about. Uh, and then later in time, I realized, wow, I'm actually spending a lot of time researching and writing on this topic. 
uh, that I had planned to do in practice, and indeed I was doing in practice, maybe I should consider a career change. So I think that's kind of another way that these uh, sessions are just multi-purposeful. It's not just if you, you know, they're not just about becoming a law professor as though we know we all want to be law professors. It's useful for finding something you love and can be intellectually engaged in, however you ultimately express that uh, interest professionally. I would say like, I went to these sessions, but I also went to other sessions of like how to start a business with your law degree and things like that. I think like Andrew Yang came to talk about like starting a giant business before he was, I guess, who he is today. And I was like, huh, like that would be an interesting thing to do with a law degree. So I was exploring sort of alternative kinds of paths. And then I always thought to myself, like, what is the most interesting set of classes that I can take next semester? I wasn't sort of planning it out of like, I have to take like one corporate based class and I have to take one of these based classes. And if I graduate without taking evidence, which I took by the way, but like if I graduate without taking evidence, I'm gonna like not pass a big piece of the bar. And I think, I don't know if that's just how I think, which makes me like reveals myself as a law professor, right? But I think you're given a whole host of really interesting sort of talks and classes and clubs to join that you should do what you think is interesting. Especially because right now, I don't think the stakes are really that high for you in choosing something. I also made the decision when I graduated, what is the most interesting job I can do right now? And eventually that became getting a fellowship and becoming a law professor. And I've never regretted that sort of path. But in law school, like the stakes are really low for you to ask yourself the question, what am I most interested in? Do I wanna go to this lunchtime talk or do I wanna like hang out with friends? And maybe it's hang out with friends. That is the thing you're most interested in. But that has been extremely valuable as a guidepost and I think you can do it here. When you looked over at me when you talked about evidence, is that because you know I didn't take evidence? No. <laughs> I didn't take evidence, we can talk about that another time too. Maybe not the best choice. Yeah. <laughs> so if you couldn't be a law professor, what would you be doing? And do you think you'd enjoy it as much as you enjoy being a professor? Ooh, can I do that one? I can do it. Go for it. Okay, question is, if I weren't a law professor, what would I be doing and would I be enjoying it as much? So uh, the path I was kind of on when I abruptly went on the academic job market was to be some kind of uh, firm associate or maybe DOJ criminal division attorney. I'd done both of those jobs for some period of time. And so I think that's probably the natural alternative timeline for me. And I will say that uh, after, after I went on the market and had got secured a job on the teaching market, I then got the most exciting casework I had gotten at the firm. And I remember thinking at the uh, kind of a party we had for, the, for concluding one of our big matters, I remember thinking, wow, if I had had this experience a year ago, would I have gone on the teaching market? Uh, so that, that makes me think that you know, if, you, if you are interested in the law for its own sake and legal reasoning and you find people who are good people that you can work with and learn from, uh, which I had definitely been fortunate enough to do, then, then uh, I think maybe the delta is not as big as it, as it might seem. But I would not be as happy, I, I like this job. <laughs> I mean, I was also at a firm when I was doing appellate advocacy and I loved argument. I loved argument. It was one of the greatest things that I could do, but it was like such a small percentage of mm. the day. Mm. So like the highs are really high, but like the normal, was not something that I, I would enjoy. Oh, how interesting, how interesting. Yeah, I love appellate advocacy. I didn't like it as much as I expected to. That was a, that was a surprise for me. Yeah, that's interesting. Over here, yeah? Uh, going back to the previous panel question, and like looking back to your uh, law school time, what is something that you wish you spent more time on or wish that you would have done when you were at uh, law school? Evidence. No way. So, so the, the, the question, the question is, looking back at law school, what did you wish you had spent more time on? What do you think? Do you have no regrets? <laughs> like my choices all made sense to me at the time. Like I, I ended up disliking some of them. Uh, yeah. Right. But like when I made the decision, it made sense to me. Oh, I, uh, my 3L year, I also worked at a law firm while I was doing 3L, so like up to 20 hours a week doing that. I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> wow. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, what do I wear? I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard. It's just hard to imagine. It's so it's so long ago now. Uh, I, I will say that, that the time that I was least happy in law school was when I was at the beginning, when I was disillusioned and disengaged and kind of wondering what I was doing there. And things got really good for me when I started seeking out things that I liked and pursuing them. And so by the end, I was kind of very active in a bunch of stuff that I didn't expect to like. Um, and uh, including moot court, which is why I thought I would like appellate advocacy, but it didn't excite me ultimately as much as I expected it to. So I guess I guess the the what that suggests is maybe I shouldn't have spent that time in the beginning. Maybe I had to, but see, maybe I had to. Maybe I had to go through a period of being unhappy and dissatisfied in order to get motivated to to change my circumstances. Prof. Cope, can you can you help us with this? What, what do you regret? Do you have regrets? Are you? <laughs> I spent way too much time on the. Northwestern version of the libel show. <laughs> <laughs> Wigmore Follies. Professor Wigmore from Northwestern. Um, but I actually don't regret that. So, I mean, from a career perspective, it was a mistake. But, you know, right. I, I have a regret. I did not like being on Law Review, and I spent a lot mm. of time doing the Law Review stuff, thinking that like I should do this, but I hated it. And I wish that I had just spent less time on it and given it what it deserved, which was like none of my time. What, 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 what position did you have? I had no position because I was so bad at, at it. But like my tool year, I spent like a lot of time as an I editor see. and I just hated it. And just because like you hate journal work doesn't mean that you shouldn't be a law professor. Like my job is not journal work. The journal editor's job is journal work. <laughs> Uh, that's interesting. I, I, I really liked uh, Law Journal, though uh, I saw people had positions that would have made me not ha like it if I had had their positions. I will say, I, I didn't do the libel show equivalent in law school, but I had occasion to do the, basically the same concept actually when I was working in one year, and I had to be kind of dragged into it. I don't even know how they got me to do it, but it was the greatest thing I ever did in my life. It was one of the happiest experiences. So I'm actually, your regret makes me jealous. I wish I had done stuff like that earlier. Oh, yep. I know you're going to touch on this in a later session, but can you just briefly explain how the Law Academy works? How the Law Academy works? Yeah. Like getting a job or being in it? Being in it. How does the... And also the process to get into it. How does the Law Academy work? Both the process of getting in and staying in. <laughs> you want to answer it? Uh, broadly speaking, there's an academic job market and you sign up in uh, over the summer to go onto the market and you prepared a bunch of materials that we will tell you exactly what those things are at a later session. And you go through a big year, uh, if you are lucky, doing interviews with lots of different schools uh, until you place with one that you're mutually happy with. Yes, and with again, you said in your question, but and Prof. You just said this too. But we're going to have a whole series of events on this. But I, I would just say that apart from the process, both the process and the actuality of being a law prof, the big thing that I think people on your side of the podium don't appreciate, and I remember people telling me when I was a student, it's a lot of research and writing. It's like I mean, it's it's obvious, but like like fully contemplating that, you have to love researching and writing stuff. The final uh, straw that made me go on the market was when I was at that firm I keep referring to, and I was spending all my free time writing a law review article. And I thought I'd rather make that my main work instead of my my side hobby. I don't even know what to call it. I mean, <laughs> so but that 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 that's what it is. What that, that's the that's the that's the big ingredient that's that is hard to fully grasp, I guess. And Professor Ray and I spend a lot of time writing law review articles. That doesn't have to be your main output. Like you could write books, you could write different sorts of articles that go into specialized journals that are not law review articles. But researching, writing, and contributing to a field of study is your job. Right. Yes. Um, so, <clears throat> so if we're interested in like an area of law that's not exactly you know offered a ton here, like for me that's federal Indian law, um, how do we sort of get our foundations for that, you know, if we would like to have that be either a practice area interest or, you know, probably more specifically um, an academic interest uh, done long. F fabulous question, yeah. How do you get involved with a subject of the law that you are interested in but is not really offered here? So I sometimes get emails from students at other schools who tell me, 
hey, I read this article of yours and I'm really interested in it. And then we talk about stuff. And I think that like, especially in niche fields, some of those emails are welcome. Like you're probably gonna send a lot more than are answered because not everybody is super nice or not busy at a particular moment in time. But I would reach out to people who write in the field that you're interested in and just ask them about it. I totally agree with that, but I would also encourage you and anyone else with a similar situation to reach out to us on the Academic Placement Committee because we have an incredible faculty here at this law school that knows a ton of stuff. A lot of people here who are like experts in like three things that you know about are also quasi-experts or experts in two things you don't know about. And so uh, I'm sure that research opportunities and education opportunities here as well as at other faculties could be created. Uh, to develop that kind of knowledge. And, and I, think so, I think this is built into your question, but I also just say finding practice opportunities in the summer or after graduation is incredible. It's an incredible opportunity to um, deepen and develop those kinds of knowledge bases and networks. So I, I think all three, it's, it's practice, it's other faculties, it's our faculty, it can be done. And there is someone on our faculty who knows a ton about federal Indian law. Indeed. Well, yeah. Indeed. So maybe even chat afterward even. So as much as I would like the idea of retaining my student loans in Eagle, uh, <laughs> uh, did that did student loan retainment factor in your decision at all? Like, can you talk a little bit about that process? Did student loan repayment factor into our decisions at all? So I think it factored into me, for me to some extent, um, that, that was a contributing factor for me going into practice for a while, for sure. But I'll say that the main, I think it was sincere, but what I thought was the main reason was uh, I didn't have a PhD and I was really curious about practice. As I mentioned, I was really into pr practice by the time I graduated from law school. I thought I would really like that. So I, I just wanted to try it. I, I didn't want to be um, someone, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I didn't want to be someone who was a teacher or whatever and had never even tried it. And that was just really important to me. And you know, going back to the other question, like it, it was transformative for me, th th those experiences in, in practice light or practice uh, for me. But yeah, but you know, money, you know, debt, that is that that you pay money. It's good to have no debt. <laughs> I mean, I remember the day I stopped having debt. Yep. And I was like, huh, I have my financial freedom now, and I can choose other things. But it was important to me to pay off my debt before taking a fellowship. Can I follow up on yeah. that? Yeah. So, do you think that you would have looked into the academia sooner had you had less debt, or was that a prohibitive factor on the front end? Uh, the question is, did, did, did the, the existence of student debt for us or for me change what we did? I, for the reasons I said, I think it was overdetermined for me. So I don't think it actually, but in a different, if things had broken a different way, I could see it affecting what I actually did, yeah. I think I would have just enjoyed having lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still would have gone to the firm. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can look up my salaries online. Right? I make about as much salary as I did as a Level SCAD associate, so I mean, we're not talking about poverty wages here. <laughs> it, it helps to be at a top six-seven law school too, and you kind of go down as you get out, go down the U.S. news tier. Um, but there's also public interest student loan forgiveness, right? Which means that if you, when you are at a law school, whether it's public or private, you pay for ten years and then it's forgiven. So you don't have that. Anymore. Um, and it's also capped, I don't know if you've looked into this, it's also capped by income-driven repayment, so it's now something like 10%. We'll see if the new Biden policies go through. So you're capped at 10% of disposable income every year. And then after paying that for 10 years, it's forgiven at least all federal subsidized loans. So it's not exactly, you can't just look at the sticker price, right, of the salary and, um, and compare like how quickly you're able to pay back loans. It could be even faster if you're in if you get the public student forgiveness. Yes. Just to briefly summarize that, law professors make good wages, or many do, and there's loan forgiveness. Definitely very important points. Maybe one or two more questions. That makes sense. So we can kind of break up into smaller group discussion. Was there a hand over here? Is there one? Someone hasn't asked yet? Yeah. yeah. I was gonna ask uh, I guess if you're going to enter the academia from practice, is it like like top 
tier litigation firm appellate advocacy or like boutique like appellate advocacy is that mainly the pathway into the academia if you're going to enter academia from practice what does that sort of look like are you coming from like a top litigation practice or what i would say can I, no, please, yeah. I, I think it depends on what it is that you're doing and what kind of academic you want to be. So uh, I remember when I was a law student, someone came and joined the faculty and he was doing like M&A stuff that was really interesting. He had spent a lot of time at Wachtell, right? Like that makes sense because they're an <clears throat> M&A firm, right? Like there are lots of people who spend time at a boutique and they develop an expertise and that's what they're writing in and then they go on and practice. A lot of people come straight from government service. And I think those people have like super interesting stories to tell about the time that they were in government. And so I don't think it's like an easy sort of, should I go to like a high ranking law firm to get a really good academic job? It's what am I interested in? Am I doing that at the place that I am? Am I a real expert? And then do I have something to contribute? Uh, totally agree. And I'll just give two kind of examples among many possible examples. So one common path, is for people who are doing criminal defense or criminal prosecution, and they go on the market from that and say, look, I've done all this trial experience. That's a, that's a, that's ha that happens. And I, I would just say also, you mentioned uh, federal Indian law um, here, but also the prior institution where I taught, that, that, was a, that was a recognizable path. People would be um, tribal court judges or uh, have practice areas that were related to those um, types of uh, legal work, and they would go right, sometimes they do a fellowship first, but they would, quickly go on, on the teaching market, and that was totally understood. I mean, it's like, yeah, you are the person who knows this. And so, you know, I, I think w one thing, and maybe this will also is getting ahead of the game a little bit for our next session or a future session, but I think the kind of prestige value of stuff in the legal academy is not what it once was. I think it used to be like the manual that Prof. Cote mentioned, like you've got to go to Yale because Yale is like the, the place to become a law professor and that's just it. I think that kind of stuff is diminishing and it's become much more about, you know, prove what you can do and prove your expertise regardless of whatever bells and whistles. So I think that the idea of being at like a, 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 a white shoe fancy firm helping on the teaching market in itself, no. If it's because you're doing the most advanced M&A work at the most advanced M&A place, okay, that, that makes sense, but that you see there was a match uh, happening there. Last question, yes. Um, are hiring committees skeptical of too much time spent in practice? And so are there kind of ways to get around that? Great question. So the question is, are hiring committees skeptical of people spending too much time in practice? And if so, are there ways to get around that? Can I take a crack at that first? Yeah. So when I was a student at an event like this, I remember a faculty member telling me that there are a lot of people out there who say five years in practice and then you're done and you cannot get a, a, a serious teaching job anymore. I believe that there are people still out there like that. And uh, I personally think that uh, as a rule or anything like that, that is like completely bonkers. And I would not approach <laughs> being on a hiring committee with that attitude. Uh, on the contrary, I would be much more of the attitude we were just talking about, which is well, what have you been doing during that time? Now, having said that, I can kind of, so I'm very against that approach. Having said that, I can kind of see what they're trying to capture by that, in my view, a misguided attitude. And what I think they're trying to capture, if I can be maximally charitable to them, is the idea that you become mentally, cognitively, psychologically habituated to thinking of things in a certain way. And at the point where you're gangbusters in some practice area, you're just used to being excellent at answering certain types of questions for certain types of purposes. And those questions and answers may not line up to the things that law professors and the academy are interested in. They may, just, they may be too granular, too immediate, uh, too doctrinal. You know, they, they may be too linked to what a particular case said instead of to something true about the world or about, about justice or about something like that. So, so I do think that there is a risk, despite my opposition to that approach, there is a risk that if someone wants to be a law professor, they could kind of lose touch with the kinds of deeper, lasting, more general questions that law professors tend to answer. But, th but that gets to the second half of what you said, how can you address that? I, I, most immediately, well, besides getting on our mailing list, <laughs> <laughs> the, most immediately, and talking to us, most immediately, you can just read the stuff. I mean, you know, when I was in, pra I was not out that long, but I was at, I guess, uh, five plus years, but I was still reading law review articles because that was the genre of scholarship that I was interested in. And so I, I didn't fully lose touch with it. I think that's mostly right. I would say, like, if you're spending like eight years at a law firm, at that critical juncture that you don't make partner, if that's the time that you're trying to go on the market, that's something you're gonna to have to explain. If it's like that amount of time, 
that this is like the second best choice for you. So I think that there's like the mind thing about your flexibility and asking the sorts of questions that I think you're totally right about. But I also think there's the, uh, did you not succeed at this other choice that you had made before? And certain timing is suspect, though not something that's insurmountable. Okay, well, thank you all for coming again. I hope I can see many of you at future events and uh, we'll hang around for a little bit and try to answer some more questions. Thank you.